Welcome back to Tune Into Inside Afternoons with me, your host, Maria Mia, and continuing with our educational insights segment. So on my way to the studio, as I was driving, the news was just in that uh, the trade union solidarity had just won their case, might I add, with costs in terms of getting uh, government to commit to the opening of private uh, preschools and early childhood development centers. So that news is, is, is breaking me and just in, in, because all the while when the minister was speaking about uh, opening of schools and that, it was great R and that, but there was no commitment given to uh, private schools. So private, because most of the early childhood development centers are private, whether it be crashes, great double R, uh, great double R's, they are all private, so there was no guidance in direction for when uh, an early childhood development center can, can reopen. But uh, uh, I think thanks to the efforts of trade union solidarity, clarity is now in that early childhood development centers provided they meet all the health and safety re uh, regulations and protocols as stipulated or gazetted by Department of Education can now open as of today. So they, they are open and uh, learners can come back. And essentially, you know what we think, they, but early childhood development and intervention is one of the most important stages in terms of developing skill, set, uh, skill sets. And for me, the foundation phase is fundamental in terms of your life skill development and skill set development that is going to support future learning. So, um, the great R's are back as well. And that is why I thought we spoke to a, a high school educator previously, and I wanted to touch base to speak to a primary school educator in terms of how the, has the tra tra transition being back to school. And only grade seven learners at primary school were back, but all the teachers, so they had grouped them into groups. So every educator had an opportunity to teach grade seven as well. So with me on the line, I have educator from Greenside Primary School, educator Raisa Ibrahim. She's actually a grade two foundation phase educator, but uh, COVID has, she, I don't think she dreamed this year that she'd be educating grade sevens as well. So that increased her skill base as well and given an opportunity to handle the older learners. And I know older learners, it's a different uh, approach in terms of their mentality, their maturity and how we educate in and facilitate their education. So she got a taste of uh, teaching grade seven and I don't think she would have thought that she was gonna do this this year. But nonetheless, I think that's what COVID does, ability to be resilient. And uh, assalamu alaikum and welcome to Salaam Media Educator Raisa. Wa alaikum salam, how are you? I'm doing well in yourself. And so tell me today the school was a little bit Fuller, so uh, you had uh, an intake of grade sixes coming back. So, how did it feel that the school community grew a little bit more? I mean, not neck to normal, but you know, that's essentially what makes a school community is the educators, the support staff, and the children. And that, so you were like uh, maybe one fifth capacity, or maybe should I say one seventh capacity. Now you're on two sevenths capacity. So how was today first? Let's go on today. Tell us how was today then? Um, it was, I think it was overwhelming, number one. For every teacher, you had a restless night just thinking about the return of, we always say our children because I always say the kids at school become yours. And it was overwhelming, but a good kind of overwhelm. You know, we felt like we were so excited. We were nervous. We were anxious. But today it turned out so well, alhamdulillah. Um, the kids were so excited to be back. The teachers were so excited to be back. And I think the hardest thing for any uh, teacher in South Africa is not to show affection to our kids because of COVID. And we're so used to hugging and welcoming our kids that it was a bit of a challenge to see them come through and they're nervous and they anxious and you just have to be like, hi, welcome back. We got you. So, um, yes, I think we dealt with the whole grade seven return. A staggered approach and now with the grade sixes coming back I think it was like a whole new ball game you think you've planned and you think you're ready and then your next lot come in and you realize okay let's go back to the drawing board and start all over again and that's what happened today 
So what? Uh, so like you say, it was difficult to be because for me that's one of the challenges of COVID is to be restrained in terms of showing that affection because I educate four year olds and it's very difficult not to show that a little physical affection or getting closer or just a little you know just a little brush down or that just to make them feel a little at ease and secure. So in terms of your your how how are you? How is the school staggering or uh, in terms of staggering the learners, first of all, and then grouping them in smaller group, uh, groups to ensure enough uh, physical distancing amongst learners and the educator? And, that, and also the reality is due to the physical constraints of the school, of the classes, and when everybody gets back, it's going to be difficult to house everybody in terms of the constraints you face with uh, sufficient physical distancing. So with the grade sixes being back, how did the school manage that process? Okay, so um, remember we had the grade six return and we had the grade R's return. That's so uh, let me just give you a bit of our grade R's because um, we obviously had a group of teachers up monitoring the grade, the entry for the grade sixes and then we had a group of teachers down at the pre-primary with our grade R's. So um, for our welcome, I think for the, especially for the little, for our babies, what we've done is we created this whole, um, like our entrance was filled with balloons. We had, um, we had a bubble machine going, we had popcorn going oh, for the kids man. this morning. It was a uh, welcome back. We were popping with excitement to meet you. So I think the kids just, uh, they, there was like that release of tension. Um, they weren't as emotional to leave mommy and daddy behind today which for me was a good sign. Uh, so that's how we had our welcome for our grade R's. And for our grade sixes, um, I think they're obviously a little bit older, so you can you can have a conversation with them. Whereas with the little ones, you actually don't know how to read the emotion. You have to try and read the emotions. And having a mask on makes this task a lot more difficult. So with our grade R's, uh, our grade sixes, we welcome them like our grade sevens. And... Um, we actually, with with, rega with regards to the staggering, what we've done is at Greenside, we've chosen um, to follow the alternating day approach. So on a Monday, Wednesday, we've split our classes down the center. And on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we have group A. And then on the Tuesday and Thursday, we have group B. But it's done on a 10-day rotation cycle. So in essence, each grade, each group is there, is here at school for, ten, for five days each. Um, I think the difficulty there is that for a teacher, every lesson that you teach has to be taught twice now, okay? Uh, the pros to that, I think, is that it helps with our class sizes because you are maintaining social distancing. And we've done a staggered approach for breaks as well so that um, our grade sixes have a different break to our grade sevens. We have also marked our field. So... During break, the learners that are on the field, we've created squares. Our square blocks are a little bit more than uh, 1.5 meters each. And then each learner is to sit on one corner of the square. So this kind of helps with social distancing, but it also ensures that the kids are still um, communicating and they're still, they're still maintaining that relationship with their friends. I think during this time, the hardest part for every child, um, what I've seen thus far is the mask. It's it restricts them completely, and they're so scared to talk. They're so scared to say anything. They're even scared to make jokes. Like they, they're so serious. I've never been. I think COVID has showed us a school that's completely quiet, and that for us as teachers, we know is not the norm. Having a quiet school is like we're running a military. It's so so sad. So I think yes, yeah. the have thought. The fun part came from educators. You know, normally the educators are the disciplinarians enforcing the discipline and the children are the ones that are full of life, uh, uh, you know, pushing your buttons, uh, testing the boundaries, testing the limits and experimenting. And now the children are so restrained and the educators are the ones that are trying to get them out <laughs> of the shells, to get them to relax, to, to just... Breathe and exhale. You know, Thank all our roles have been now redefined. And, and like we had, we, had, we had an activity with the grade sevens, um, I think two weeks ago. I said to our principal, Ms. Scott Paul, um, I said to her, we can't. We can't do this. The school is way too quiet. 
So we literally put out a speaker. We called the grade sevens out early for break. We like literally 45 minutes early. We played um, a song and we said to them, right. And it was like, it was a cha-cha slide. It was just testing their left and right movements. And we said to them, loosen up. And even at that point, the kids were just like, are we supposed to do this? Is this allowed, you know? So it's going to take a long time for us to get where we want our kids to be. But I think teachers are so willing to persevere. Yeah, so yeah, I, I, I really admire that your way just to create a new normal, but a normal because you know, the for me is even now, uh, you, you're grappling because of the exponential spike in the number of cases of people being tested positive. There's so much fear, there's so much anxiety, and I think listening to all the, the reports and facts and figures. And the cautions, and even talk about maybe uh, close uh, moving outing back to a level four, level, level five yeah. option, right? So yeah. to go up a level again like this, and there's so much uncertainty. And at home, you must understand uh, people, families of uh, one at least a, one parent is being retrenched or has to take a salary cut. So there's mm. so much tension at home and also balance of this uh, parental in uh, instinct, maternal and per paternal instinct to protect the children. And also they're grappling with, I'm, I'm ch sending my child to school. Is it the correct thing? Am, I'm, yes. am I not harming my child? By saying, so children are picking up of their fear. And all so your they're, emotions. Coming, they're coming with their fear to school. And yes. before, I mean, they left, I'm sure they must have been counseled at home with, don't go here, don't touch this, keep away. So besides what you as educators are doing, they've already been schooled in terms of how they need to behave, health and safety protocols have already been counseled towards them. Or maybe I think at a point where now they can't take it anymore. So it was so, I, I, I admire your approach. It was so, uh, I think refreshing is the word that I could say that you come in a, a, for me as a great art. Uh, I've been told by my mother uh, not or my parents not to touch something, not to share my friend's eyes, lunch, no hugging my friend, no shaking my friend's hand. I mean, they've been, and then I come to school and I see this popcorn machine and this bubble machine and Oh, I guess my it was so beautiful. Oh, cool. It was such a nice thing. It was, you know, the parents walked in and they were like, can we bring all the kids back? And I said to them, you know, um, I would love that. I think that's the hardest thing for us teachers right now. Yes, we're busy with Zoom lessons. The internet drops. Um, you, you, you're seeing a child sit there, but the parent is on the side saying, you don't know this. You don't know this. And you you can hear this, but you 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 know your child. I, I mean, with like I told you, as a teacher, you know the kids in your class. You know their capabilities. And sometimes it takes a child longer to get something and you're okay with it. That's why teachers are born teachers because you you know how to deal with every learner differently. Now you're on the Zoom lesson and a child is like pushed to do a certain thing and the parent is so standing there like, so that's hectic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really stressful. No, no, and I, and I see, and that is why the transition back because I'm in the same space because like I say, I've got a, a development program specifically for four-year-olds and um, I've seen this and I've tried to counsel the parents to say, you know what, uh, I initially I told them it's about the process of gaining the skill and not yes. to not to see the work is done. It's it's yes. the journey, not the destination. Yes. As a parent, you have so many things to do and so many deadlines to meet, especially if you're working from home now. So you just want that work to be done. So that worksheet was sent. As long as that worksheet is completed in your mind, uh, it's done. It's been consolidated because my yes. child did it. So then that equals consolidation. You can see how we're relating to each other because the educators and us come. And in the parent, the parent now is not trained to understand that no, even if the worksheet was half done, but whatever was completed, there was a fundamental understanding of the skill set behind there, the learning outcome that needs to be achieved there. And you've managed this part, but you're struggling here. No worries. We are going to work at it and revise it until we master it. And then this work will be done. So in essence, that wasn't done. And I found, which you which you probably find, is the children have been so used to being dictated by. So on your Zoom lesson, there, there, there isn't that platform or that time 
to get response and ask that many questions and get them to think so that the neural pathways are opened. So basically, we're just giving information and trying to condense everything and work with the concerns you have. Then you have a parent that's sitting there and hovering almost. We all become helicopter parents because we're hovering there. You do. So we, we're just dictating to the child. And what I find is the brain is gone lazy because it, there was no opportunity to open new pathways. So when you ask them a question, they're forgetting. They're forgetting. I asked them where water comes from and they told me the ocean. And I said, high up in the sky. I said, what do you find in the sky? And they battled and they forgot. And then when I said clouds and I said, when the clouds get heavy and, the, and they burst, what comes out? And they're waiting for me to tell them. And... Previously, it would just come through. That's, that's not because because the mind has gone now. Lex. Those those pathways, new ones haven't opened up. And I said, that's why we need to balance uh, our fears and anxieties regarding the pandemic with yes. the need for children to be educated in an educational environment with trained, uh, dedicated, passionate professional facilitators uh, who is going to make a positive intervention in there? So, how is their trans transition being with the grade sevens? Are, are they now back into school mode? Uh, okay, so mode. They are. So, I would say initially we had, but you know what? I can say this as a teacher as well. I got back to school, and I promise you, my mind only started working at nine o'clock. I was like, oh yes, I'm here, and I need to start working. Like that's what lockdown did for me. It kind of put me into this lexi daisy mood and when you got back to school you were like oh this is reality you know so it took us as adults so long to get there i think for the kids um the first two weeks was like do i have to COVID? yeah i'm scared to take out my mask this and that and eventually now you can see the grade sevens are um, are now into their role they understand and i also think it's that safe space knowing that you're here now and you're okay. You're gonna. You are going to be okay. You know. So I do. I have seen a transition with the grade sevens. They now into it. They understand. They know what rules to follow. The hard part, I think, and the challenge part. The challenging part is that every group is placed in one class. So they're used to moving around and that interaction um, in the corridors. Oh, hi to my friend, and that can't happen anymore. It's literally you're stuck in the class or the rest of the day and the only time you actually come out is for breaks and if you have PE or you have a bit of a break that's that's I think is the challenging part for them but they have really a, they've they've done really well I must say and I think now you can see you can hear them and I think from it's it's amazing how teachers we like you say our whole life we were like Shh, keep quiet keep quiet and now you like talk talk you know so and now that they are talking, you can see um, a bit of our kids coming back to life. And I think that for me is so overwhelming and it's so good to see. Yeah. And, what's so they encouraging me, mm -hmm. and from what you're saying, what's so encouraging for me is now you've uh, had a chance in terms of grade sevens where your experimental uh, group and they were older so it was easier so now you have an idea how to assess the other grades like the grade sixes uh, their transition I'm understanding I'm thinking now would be much easier because you've experienced based on the fears of the grade sevens and the reservations in it and how to transition so I would think the grade seven transition would be easier because you know the constraints you know what uh, the expectation is there and yes. also you are better equipped uh, in terms of uh, uh, mentally understanding how to get them back and assist them to tra transit from that homeschooling Zoom online lesson and sometimes didn't work out because of technology problems and things like challenges. So the, the transition for the grade sixes would be a little uh, easier. And as they come like this, they're going to do that. So um, you've taken all your precautions and, and, and they've now becoming, uh, how have they adapted to this? new way of life um like i said initially it was a big thing for them um but now you can see you know like uh from what we see with this with the whole mask and sanitizing or whatever the grade sevens it took them a good two to three weeks and now they're into it they know okay this is the routine i think you have to set with the kids especially there has to be some sort of routine that they know this is this is what 
I think we've got technology <laughs> issues there. I see Sister Isna's picture just froze. Okay, Sister Isna, do I have you back momentarily? We have the technological <laughs> challenge momentarily now, but now I can see you. You and uh, you, you no longer frozen. You froze for a while, okay. but you. I'm back. Okay. Okay. And now you back. So, so okay. Yes. Now what I need to ask you finally because <clears throat> this week is a week of uh, confusion, and I think many parents are conflicted. They weighing the importance of education and being in the educational institution and trusting that health and safety protocols have been put in place by the schools. Yes. Otherwise, they won't open. So, I mean, <laughs> your school and principal and school management team have followed regulations and you uh, you have put everything in place to receive the learners and you have been doing it. And then now weighing that across the, the epi, uh, Gauteng being the epicenter here, and I think this is true for major areas that the spike is here now, the peak is here. And now to keep your, because that's what you do as parents, your paternal and maternal instincts is the safety of your offspring. So you need to protect them, the high need of protection. So you have to balance these two and find middle ground and trust in it. So what advice do you, do you give to parents because if they still conflicted about maybe some some parents must have kept the children back and deciding to see how it goes. So what advice is an educator who is now taught the grade sevens and come up with in, uh, innovative ways and fun ways, refreshing ways to actually get them to be calm and to go on? What advice for parents who are currently listening and feeling so conflicted? I think the... Parents need to understand that now teachers have put their lives at risk as well. So number one, we are now in the for, on the forefront. We are obviously putting ourselves out there to ensure that edu the te kids are educated. I think that's the first thing. So as teachers, you put your fears behind knowing that there's a bigger picture. And I think with that said, parents need to um, as much, yes, we all... I mean, uh, com coming from uh, from my parents as well, they, uh, as old as I am, they're like, do you have to go to work? And I'm just like, you need to understand my job is my job. And for me, I think the best thing we could do for those kids is to have them in class with us. And the only way that is going to happen is if parents, like, I understand it's a difficult process and I understand it's like putting your child in the lion's den and saying, this is it. But I think if you do, if you don't take the risk, because like if you look, if you read all the literature and stuff on on COVID, and if you read um, read it, uh, if you read the literature and you see you see it against what how kids get it or how kids are affected, you will see that um, many of it, many of the literature say, states that a lot of our children are not they do carry it, they do get sick, but it's it's it, it leaves them very quickly. It is a risk. We are all taking the risk together. And for people by going outside, just leaving your home is a risk. Exactly. You know, it's leaving Not your even home. leaving your home. If you at home, I'm just thinking now, besides going at home, if you at home and then you have two or three family members going out to work because they need to. So the risk is at home as well. But like remember, I say, yeah. It's remember, it's you can your child can get the virus by you just stepping out the house and even going to pick and pay or going to Woolworths or whatever, or your child just needs to go and get something, you take that child with, that child is at risk. We are all at risk. It's it's something that we all are, we all are putting ourselves, ourselves out there because it's the next, this is the new norm. The question, the question is, when is the old norm coming back? We don't know. So, are we going to are we going to live in fear that for the next 2 years my child won't be educated or you rather have that child sent to school and have your trust we all believe in faith we all we all are believers whether you're muslim not muslim you obviously believe in a god and we all have that faith that what is meant to be will happen and if you walk with knowing that you are going to do i mean you're not doing wrong education is a good thing you're sending your child out you obviously send your child out to the them and and they're protected. They... So I think the main thing is, like you say, you've taken protected. your precautions. So they sanitize. And at school, the school is the 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 educators there, the parent, parents in local. That is what we are. We are taking the, the place of parents. We are ensuring that whatever protocols in terms of protecting our children from protecting, contracting the disease, we are putting those 
uh, measures in place, measures in and place. then you yes, say, we have all the measures in place. So we we've put all our. So that's what you. I'm just summarizing what you. I'm in understanding you. So in summation, you're saying precautions from home are taken. Precautions at school at are school taken. Are protocols taken. are put are taken there. Educators are increasingly vigilant in terms of yes. the new way of life and ensuring that everything is done so that uh, the opportunity of contracting the disease is very, very minimal or limited. I mean, there's always going to be a risk, even if there's no COVID always. going out to school, that is a risk. But we've yeah. took a, a calculated risk. We've taken precautions and yeah. uh, balanced that with the need for education, send them out and thus. And we also need to remember at this point, kids are bound to get sick. It's not, getting the flu during winter is not is not something foreign to us. So yes, that's going to happen. So um, I think we just, like you say, walk in faith, take the, we've taken the necessary precautions. I mean, we're sanitizing all the time. We're ensuring that the kids wash their hands as often as possible. The kids wearing masks, they're maintaining social distancing. So we have covered our tracks, parents covered their tracks and you just have to take that risk and know that as an educator, I, I can first uh, personally, I think it's better for a child to be taught in a classroom than over any online lessons, because I find we connect with the kids way better. So I would, I, to all the parents that are listening, please send your kids back. I, I, right now, I, I like wish my foundation phase could just be back so we can actually start making a difference. I, I hear your passion and I hear your plea and uh, take the calculated uh, risk because life is a risk. Anything we do is a risk. So mm -hmm. take the calculated risk and try and see, let the children start a new normal, but attend classes and uh, educators uh, like Sister Raisa here is waiting for you, bubble machine, popcorn and all, <laughs> making noise and all, she's missing the noise. The harass in yeah. Afrikaans, as well as here, they're missing that, the noise. So noise and all, she's, she, they're waiting to receive you. And please do your best and try your best and re reciprocate that commitment and dedication out there. And I think more than ever, the need for the educational connection between educator, parent, is needed and, much more than ever. And that, tri that education triangle and the education and circle of ho holding hands and connecting is what we need more than ever because that is what's going to get us through in terms of the connection and communication between the learners, the parent and the educator. Thanks so much for enlightening us here. And uh, really it was such a lot. I thought it's going to be a difficult conversation because the topic is re was really difficult <laughs> and concerning and and it was heavy, but uh, your lovely, affable personality has made it easy and lighten it. And I think put many conflicted parents, I think, at ease at the moment and, and given us some pos positivity. And thank you. You actually gave us a better insight and inspired us here on Educational Insight on Inspired Afternoon. So shukran for your time. Much appreciated. as alaikum wa alaykum. Wa alaykum wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And just sorry, one more thing. To every teacher out there, just know that you're doing a good job. And we are all in this together. We're going to get through. We will definitely get through it. Summa Amin, inshallah, and Summa Amin. And that is my show for today. I was certainly inspired and enlightened today with all my guests. And I hope I've earned the privilege of your time and your company until tomorrow on Inspired Afternoons. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.